Hi everyone, I'm Grace Chamolu from Product Management Festival. Thank you very much for joining us today for this executive education webinar on assessing and adapting the org culture in these unprecedented times. Our speaker today will be Noah Askin from INSEAD. I'd like to just make a note right now that this session is being recorded. For those of you who don't know Product Management Festival, it's an organization whose mission is to help amplify the impact of product leaders globally. And on a professional development standpoint, we partnered with NOAA and INSEAD to develop the Product Management Executive Program. I have the honor of introducing a wonderful speaker, a wonderful person um, for today. And Noah Askin is an Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior and teaches at the INSEAD Fontainebleau, France campus. His teaching primarily focuses on firm's organizational strategic alignment, uh, org design, leading and experiencing organizational change, managing corporate culture, and utilizing social networks. At INSEAD, in addition to this product executive program, he also teaches other executive programs as well as leads the core MBA program on the organizational design and leadership course. For his teaching, Noah has received the Dean's Commendation for Teaching Excellence at the graduate level as well as the executive level. And after hearing him speak in the past at PMF conferences and also hearing him teach in the classroom, this does not surprise me at all that he's received these awards. So with that, Noah, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Grace. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm just looking at the board of names over here, and I see a lot of familiar names. And I see people from my distant past. Hi, Libby. Thanks for joining from, I think, New York, uh, to former students, former participants from the product management executive program. Uh, thank you for coming. It's great to have you here. Um, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions. Grace will be following along. And at the end, I'm hoping to have 10, 15 minutes uh, to answer questions. And I can also stick around a little bit after the fact in order to do so. Uh, for those of you that know me, you do know that I like to talk a lot. So I will do my best to leave some time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. And so th the reason for coming here today is to talk about culture. And yes, it's, it's very much geared towards people in product, but I think that this is applicable to people across the board. It's also geared towards culture and cultural change and adaptation in the current crisis. But I do think that the ideas here are going to be applicable to any kind of situation where you're managing other people, where you're being managed by other people, where you're leading organizations. And so it's really about assessing and adapting culture in an environment that's constantly shifting. Uh, and you'll see there's a little quote in the upper right hand corner of the slides. This is from Yuval Noah Harari. And it says, culture is a series of fiction, or at least human creations, told enough times and believed by enough people to be considered true or valid. It consequently drives behavior. Now, he's talking about it in, in broad human societal levels, but I think that it actually applies quite nicely to organizations. Basically, it's how things are done around here. And oftentimes, we don't necessarily know why. So that's kind of our starting point. And, and with that in mind, what I really like to do to kick things off is to actually get you to tell me a little bit more about where you are and where you're coming from. And so whether you're on a phone or on a laptop or a desktop, um, you can head to menti.com uh, or to use your phone and, and scan the QR code that's up on the slide. And we're gonna head over and just have a couple of questions for you to answer to figure out who I'm talking to and kind of how you feel about culture at the moment. So I encourage you to head over there and see where people are coming in from. Already looks like a very INSEAD collection coming from all over the world. This is great to see. Switzerland, not surprisingly, with PMF and everything going on there. Okay, 
Great. Thank you to those of you who, who chimed in and let us know where you're coming from. Pretty good collection from as far away as Singapore and, and, and New York and Canada, Chicago, uh, great to see, and San Francisco, uh, really spanning the globe here. So, you know, this, these are topics that are certainly relevant to, to people, no matter what stage of career you're in, no matter where you're located, uh, and hopefully the frameworks and ideas that you're going to hear about today are going to be applicable wherever you are and, and wherever you sit. So that's question one, just to give us a nice little grounding of, of who's here and, and where you're coming from. Question two, a little bit more to the point. On a scale from one to 10, one being not at all, 10 being completely, how happy were you? How, how much did you enjoy the company culture of the organization that you're currently with before the crisis? So think, you know, January of this year, how are you feeling about the culture of your company? Okay, that's skewed reasonably higher than I would have expected. That's not so bad. Give it another minute or two. Okay, so on the upper end of things, but not most people aren't necessarily fainting uh, from excitement from their company culture. I think that stands to, that's pretty standard. Um, and I would actually argue that this might be higher than, than a random sampling of the population at large. Um, and then finally, and to those of you who, if you've had trouble getting into Menti or you've chosen not to, no problem, we're gonna be jumping back in the slides at, in like one minute. Uh, and then finally, last question, how is your happiness, how do you, how you feel about the culture of your or current organization? How has it changed since you've now gone into social distancing, quarantine, you know, much different ways of working? Okay, so, you know, pretty even split. We got about, I don't know, 40 to 50% of the respondents chiming in, which is, which is a good, that's a good number for most surveys. Um, and it's split and, and I'm not surprised to see that people feel less happy because there's no longer the connection there. Uh, there's no longer the opportunity to kind of experience a lot of the upside that people associate with work uh, and also all of the additional stresses, which I'm gonna get into in just a minute. Uh, so thank you for, for responding to this. It's good to get a sense of kind of where everyone is and, and how they're feeling about things. Um, so coming back to the, to the, the main point here, the, the main presentation, let's start off by thinking about what exactly is the current context, right? We talk about the current crisis, but, but what exactly do we mean by that? Well, a couple things are, are fundamental to, to what's going on and, and have been experienced pretty much by everyone, no matter where you are. First and foremost, there's been a nearly instantaneous transition to completely remote, fully distributed teams. And this is a process that's been ongoing and you might have, have had a work environment or a work setup that was like this to begin with. But the fact that it's now forced, it's now for everyone, and it happened basically instantaneously was, gave a lot of people a, a little bit of whiplash. So, so that's the first consideration. The second consideration, you've got dramatically increased stress and anxiety pretty much across the board. Um, certainly, there's the, the COVID and health and economic related issues, but it goes beyond that for sure. Um, yeah, work and life now have 100% overlap, um, right? If you're working from home all the time, you, there's really, it's really difficult to escape what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis from work and from life. And, you know, as somebody who often worked from home, even prior to the crisis, I can tell you that when you're able to work from anywhere, especially from your home, you kind of are working everywhere. Uh, and so the, the amount of stress that goes along with that is significant, as is the fact that for those of you with kids or people that you take care of, you've probably lost that care, the child care school, that's a uh, major anxiety uh, increaser, and you have limited socialization, right? You don't have the opportunities to interact with others and to, to kind of relax a little bit. And it's worth noting that people in product, and, and I've learned this in, in the last several years of talking to people in product roles, they often are among the lonelier people in the company to begin with. 
and you may be nodding along, you may be scratching your head, but what I've often found is it's similar to the idea that it's easier to be lonely in the city than it is in the country, in a small town or in the countryside. Because just because you're interacting with a lot of people regularly, which people in product tend to do, that doesn't necessarily mean you feel part of like a core unit. And for those of you with really developed product uh, teams and organizations, that's great and you may have that feeling, but a lot of product people work in situations where they're one of three or five or seven product managers. And so they don't have quite the core group that people in other areas of the organization do. And so there's already that loneliness to begin with. And, and this I'm sure, you know, didn't help that. The, the current crisis didn't, didn't help that at all. And then finally, you know, the last thing I wanna do with this, with this webinar is get into a political discussion. So don't consider that, that's not what I'm doing here. But what I do wanna say is that there are massively heightened racial and political tensions. Uh, and just because they're centered in the United States doesn't necessarily mean it's not being, it's not being felt by people all around the world. You can see that in the, in the various protests and reactions that have gone on globally. Uh, and its impact is, is realized on a day-to-day -day stress and anxiety basis. Uh, and so it's just worth keeping these things in mind as sort of the backdrop to everything that we're talking about here when we, when we start to focus more organizationally. So that's the global context. From the PM context, uh, it, I wanted to check in a little bit more and get a sense of, okay, well, where, what's the temperature of people that are working in product functions? And if you're wondering how I have this information, uh, there's a link on the bottom of the slide. Uh, and basically every year, Product Management Festival does a trends and benchmark survey. And this year it went out to about 2000 people working in product or rather 2000 plus people filled it out. Um, and this was taking place uh, between November and December, the data was collected. So things may have changed a little bit since then, but it does give a little bit of a sense of, of what's going on in the product function, at least as it relates to culture and people in general. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the organization, this, this particular graph has asked people to say, like, what is the current focus of the product organization? And you know, number one, in terms of current focus, not surprisingly, the product and or the services, number two, processes and methods. Makes sense. But if you look at the red, which is the desired focus of people working in the product, number one, leadership and culture, number two, people, capability, people and capability, capabilities development. And so what you see is that, yes, of course, there's a focus on, on sort of the, the tangible as, aspects of the job, the product, the services, the, the processes, but people have this longing for things to be more focused on leadership, to be more focused on development. Uh, and so that's really, you know, part of the human side of this. And for those of you working in product, and, and you probably feel this as well. Relatedly, uh, when asked how open are you to a new job, um, you can see the comparison in blue from last year to this year in red. Uh, the number of people actively looking, this again was in November and December, has gone up dramatically from 25 to 31%. Uh, and even though there's been a slight drop in the people that aren't looking but are still open, you're still looking at nearly 50% of people in product. So between actively looking and open to a new role, you're talking about you know, almost 80% of the people working in product are open to new positions. And a lot of it has to do with the previous graph about not feeling like they're being developed, not feeling like culture is being attended to. Uh, and then finally, why do PMs leave their jobs? Um, I would actually argue that you know, no opportunities to grow, which is the number one reason, poor management performance, bad team culture, all of those are related to culture and people development. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. So the human element really, really runs deep, is quite strong when it comes to thinking about culture in general and specifically for people working in product. Uh, and so, you know, there's a really nice quote that I liked from Richard Banfield, who wrote about, who wrote the book Product Leadership. Uh, and this is in a blog post and, and he talks about the fact that most product team challenges are people challenges, prioritize people over process. And so the idea here is to be much more thoughtful about who you're dealing with, what they're going through, how you can help, uh, help them develop, help them grow, and how you can, can really serve as, as somebody that creates a culture where, where everyone, not just, this doesn't just apply to people in product, where everyone feels like there's a sense of belonging. Uh, so that's, you know, there's, there's a strong humanity underlying the global context, the context for product management, and, and really, you know, the idea here is to how can we better think about managing that effectively. So what I hope that you leave with today, uh, now that we're a third of the way through, I'll give you, give you the punchline and then we'll, we'll go back and run through each. First and foremost, yes, you absolutely can influence culture. 
and e perhaps even more so during the crisis, right? Lots of things are in flux right now. And so your opportunity, regardless of where you in, what level you are in your organization, you now have an opportunity to influence culture, maybe in a way that you didn't when you were going into the office much more regularly. Uh, and so that's, that's the big punchline. And then the, the four things that I hope that you leave with. Uh, number one, it's the little things that matter when it comes to culture. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of what I mean by that. Number two, don't over-index, don't over-focus on expressed values. People tend to think culture are these pithy punchlines about what we care about in our particular organization. Those are important, don't get me wrong, but don't overemphasize those. And I'll tell you why. I'm gonna give you a quick way to gauge culture for those of you that may be looking for new opportunities, for wanting to better understand the culture in your current organization, uh, or that you're just looking for, for ways to possibly shift the culture. This is one way to think about it. Uh, and then finally, sort of an evergreen, uh, a little empathy goes a long way. So that's the four main ideas. Let's jump in. Number one, as an example, it's the little things. And as a pretty extreme example, I wanna talk about Exxon and BP. Um, some of you that are old enough may remember the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which was at the time the worst oil spill in human history. Um, and you know the, this idea that one Valdez, one big incident can kill the company. And in the case of Exxon, it almost did. And so what happened in reaction to that was a pretty dramatic shift in the safety culture at Exxon. But the safety culture, while it was vast, really came down to a lot of small, almost nitpicky type things, uh, right? So things like no front end parking in the parking lot because most driving accidents occur in the first few minutes of driving. There were radar guns in the parking lots at Exxon. The second time you got a warning for speeding in the parking lot, fired. No phones in cars, not even headsets. Every single safety announcement. Uh, so there's a safety announcement at every single meeting. It begins every meeting. And so these things feel nitpicky and they, they, they might not have anything to do with what's going on on an oil rig, uh, which is where the accident occurred, or in a tanker where the accident occurred. And so what happens when you start to make these little changes, you have high turnover because people are like, I don't, I don't want to live like this. This is not how I want to exist on a day-to-day -day basis. But the people that stick around, their attitudes follow their behavior, right? You get quotes. There was a quote of somebody who, who exists, who worked through the crisis and continued to work at Exxon afterwards. And he said something like, I just didn't understand how dangerously I was living before, right? You come to change your worldview as a function of the way that you're behaving. So that's Exxon, little things, how they reacted. Fast forward, BP, 2010, CEO Tony Hayward, this is after the Deepwater Horizon, which surpassed the Valdez oil spill as the largest in history. You know, he's sitting with his fellow CEOs and said, what the hell did we at BP do to deserve this? So if you want to know what they did to deserve this, well, let's compare the egregious willful safety violations in three years in the U.S. amongst the competitors. You can see that their competitors ate, you know, two Exxon, clearly their safety culture was doing good work. And just think for a second of how many you think BP might have done, right? If the little things matter, and what did BP do to deserve this? For those of you that have sat in my class before, you've seen me give this slide, so you know the answer. 760. Right? And so as a CEO, you ask, what do we do to deserve this? Well, when you allow all the little things to happen, all the little incidents, and you don't take care of the little things, they very quickly balloon up and escalate to the big things. And so when I talk about the little things mattering in culture, this is what I'm talking about. The little day-to-day -day activities that really influence culture across the board. One a more recent and more relevant example, uh, this is from the Hertha Berlin Soccer Club. Um, so part of the Bundesliga. I have to admit, I don't know a huge amount about the Bundesliga. It was actually a former, uh, former PMEP uh, participant who shared this with me, but I really liked it, so I wanted to include it, include it here. Uh, so the Bundesliga was the first football league to reopen. There's a lot of, of sort of excitement about it, the fact that sports are returning in the midst of this crisis. So this is happening right now, by the way. A uh, lot of excitement, also a lot of concern. Are the players going to be taken care of, the people involved, right? They're playing games in empty stadiums. Um, and there's a lot of restrictions and rules put in for the teams about practicing, playing, all of that. Well, amidst all of this, uh, there was a forward from the Hertha Berlin club named Salomon Kalu, who live streamed himself uh, walking into the locker room with his club, shaking hands with people, downplaying COVID, fist bumping people, you know, talking about the fact that somebody was in visiting the team position and wondering, oh, I hope it's not COVID, like very jokey. And 
you know, it was very much not taking it seriously and nobody on the team did or said anything about it at all. Uh, and so, you know, after a slow public reaction from the team and a strong reaction from the league and from the public, he was ultimately suspended. Okay, so we got rid of the one guy who was breaking the rules and we made an example out of it. Okay, fine. Well, fast forward to the first matches. When teams score goals, there's celebrations. If you've ever watched a football match at all, you know this. Uh, all the other teams celebrate appropriately, fist bumping, etc. And despite the fact that Kalu had been uh, suspended, well, Hertha, when they scored uh, or were in set pieces, they had some difficulties uh, obeying the rules there. Uh, this is a, you know, the players were talking about, well, they were discussing strategy during a set piece. Okay, fine. However, very clearly not obeying the rules. And so the point, and these are sort of funny, extreme examples, are what you allow on a day-to-day -day basis or what you do on a day-to-day -day basis really matters for, for what goes on all the time. You know, how you spend your days is how you spend your life effectively. And so these little things really do make a difference. And so sort of stepping back and talking about this in the realm of culture, you know, an idea is more likely to take hold where there are small but consistent reminders of the idea's main intent. That is, culture develops and changes via actions which are many, large and small, but most of all consistent, that lead to new behaviors. And so the idea is, how do you change the little things that are going to add up and, and be reflected in your culture? And so I've posed some questions and, and you know, this will be recorded, you'll have access to it. Um, I, my email is at the front of this. You can find me easily online if you would like the slides um, because I've posed some questions here for you to be thoughtful about your own culture, right? What are the little things that I do, meaning you, and that my company and team does? And how do those inform or influence our company culture, both for good and for bad? What are the little things that, that take place on a day-to-day -day basis that you can actually start to think about, yeah, wait a second, this does contribute to something broader in the culture of our organization. And if you're thinking about this in, in, in light of the current environment, you know, how often do you check in on your team's emotional state and their well-being, right? How often do you, and, and are you genuinely interested, right? There's, there's an opportunity right now for this sort of perfunctory, oh, how you doing, uh, not so great, or, you know, getting by sort of thing. But how, how genuine and how authentic are you in your interest in what's going on? And what does that do for the team's morale? However you answered that question, right? Psychological safety, which I'm not gonna go into in great depth in this particular presentation, but it's a huge, huge driver of team success, particularly for product teams. And so, you know, a lot of, of psychological safety comes from, you know, an understanding and a vulnerability amongst team members. And so if you're checking in regularly, which just seems like a, a pretty small thing, but it has a big impact. If you're doing it regularly, you're gonna help develop and maintain psych safety throughout this, the remote working experience. Secondly, little things. How structured or how flexible are you with your meetings and your work requests during this, right? With a lot of external uncertainty and a lot of stress, you don't necessarily wanna to add to other people's stress levels unwittingly by popping up a meeting here or not obeying to a time, you know, a time pressure there. Uh, you know, there are culture and stress-related implications based on how you respond to this, the structured or rigidity and flexibility. Right? And I'm not saying that one is right and one is wrong. The question is, what does your team want and what does your team need? The bottom line is you need to communicate effectively and efficiently and also to listen. Luckily, you're all working in product or many of you are working in product. And so you should actually be quite good at communication and listening by this point, I hope. Uh, and then finally, you know, what small or regular rituals have you created? Um, just little things, simple but that actually help build team spirit that, that are good for socialization, their culture reinforcement, they occasionally add some humor. Um, you know, at the OB area at INSEAD, we start every meeting going around for all the faculty members uh, saying, what's one recent piece of good news? And some people roll their eyes and they'd still do it anyway. And I will tell you that it actually sets a nice tone for the time, by the time you jump into the meeting, everybody's talked about something good that's happened. Even in the current climate, it can go a long way towards finding the little things that you're grateful for. Uh, another idea, share an embarrassing Zoom experience. My guess is you've all had them by now. So can you share that? Can you have some levity in your particular uh, group meeting? So these are the little things to think about, which brings us to takeaway number two, um, <clears throat> which is not over-indexing, not over-focusing on expressed values. Uh, and again, those of you who've, who've sat in my sessions or class, you will, this will look familiar to you. Um, and my point is not that values are totally useless, although sometimes they are. My point is that 
they're not necessarily good drivers of behavior. Uh, and, and just to give you sort of a little bit of an old but a really nice example of this, let's take IBM. IBM has since changed their values, uh, but this is Tom Watson Sr. in the early days of IBM, and their primary values were customer service, excellence, respect for the individual. Sounds great. Who can't get behind those things? Uh, the problem is, like, what does that look like? And does it really mean anything to the people that are working there, especially when those exact same values are shared by Walmart, right? I don't think anybody's confusing the culture of Walmart with the culture of IBM. And so it's not that these are inherently bad, it's just that they're not necessarily of much individual unique meaning towards the organization and the people working there. Uh, and just as a really nice example of this, uh, any guess who respect, integrity, communication, and excellence belong to, um, you know, the fact that I'm putting it up here means you probably could figure out that they belong to Enron. Values don't necessarily carry a lot of weight or a lot of meaning. Uh, so those are values. And so what I want, want to do is to introduce a framework for thinking about culture. And values are very much a part of this, but I would like to actually minimize that part of this. And this is a framework that was developed by a sociologist who is still actually working at MIT. His name's Ed Shine. I think he's in his 90s. And he had three levels for thinking about culture. And this is a, a way of almost classifying culture in a particular organization. And, and you'll see why I said not to over-index on values in just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> the first level is artifacts. And this is what you see and what you experience. You observe them, you live them, but they're often tough to interpret. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean things like the observable symbols, the incentives in your organization, your KPIs, the phys physical space, which matters a little bit less now, uh, the appearance of your office, how people dress, how people talk to each other and communicate, the practices and rituals, the stories, all of the little things that take place in your organization, whether that you physically see and touch or that you experience yourself, those are the artifacts. And what's interesting about artifacts is if you want to change a culture, this is, how they, this is where you start. You start changing the rituals, you start changing the incentives, you start changing what's valued. Uh, but the problem is that in and of itself doesn't necessarily change culture. But put that thought to aside for just a minute. Level one, artifacts. Level two, here's where the values come in, right? These are the espoused beliefs and values. This is what the organization maybe should think, what you'd like them to think, what you want to as aspire to. They're very often shared. Lots of organizations now have them posted, posted in various places around their office. Um, they can be actual, they can be aspirational. And, and like I demonstrated with the IBM and, and Walmart example, they don't always have a lot of grounding in reality. And so this is where it becomes very tricky. Uh, they can prove valuable, but only if they're developed after the culture is kind of agreed upon and, and exists in place. Um, and then the bottom level, and this is maybe the hardest part to interpret and figure out, but it's actually the, the fundamental driver of behavior and what, where culture, culture really comes from is, are these assumptions. These are, are the reasons for thinking and behaving the way that you do in an organization. Usually they're taken for granted. They're not verbalized. But if you were to be, you know, take somebody totally new, put them into your organization, not give them much help, and tell them just to sort of walk around and figure it out, right? They would encounter lots of artifacts, but they would have to kind of interpret like, what are they, what messages are these artifacts sending for as far as my behavior is concerned? And those messages, those are the assumptions, right? This is the ultimate source of action. These are non-negotiable values, but they're oftentimes very difficult to understand. So let me give you some examples, because uh, I understand that, that this particular framework can be a little tricky, especially as you're thinking about, well, how do I put this into, into place in my workspace? And so what I want to do is I want to link some artifacts to assumptions to get a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, and so let me, let me start with an example uh, of, from Amazon. And so Amazon, uh, many of you may or may not know, Jeff Bezos in his slightly better haired, slightly less jacked days, uh, definitely poorer days. Um, he started out at Amazon and there was this myth or this legend that is actually apparently true that he built his first desk out of a door uh, because he was basically so busy and there wasn't much money. And so he went across the street from wherever Amazon was based at the time. He purchased a door, a couple two by fours, hammered it together and created a desk door. Uh, and apparently, as the legend goes, the desk in his office to this day is still a door desk. 
and a lot of other people that work at Amazon built their desks out of doors. And so this is the artifact, the fact that there are these pretty budget looking and budget costing desks across you know, all levels of the organization up to the very, very highest levels. That's the artifact. And, and really, well, what does it mean? And, and what is the assumption here? And the assumption underlying this, and it's reflected in lots of different aspects of behavior at Amazon, is do more with less, right? Be creative, be uh, inventive. Rest constraints are gonna actually force you to be more efficient and more effective at what you do. And so you link the artifact, this door does, to this assumption that's driving a lot of behavior, right? Do more with less. Only after that, did Amazon, after this was part of the culture at Amazon, did Amazon develop its values? And so when you go to Amazon's website now and you look at what their values are, two of them are frugality and invent and simplify. And so th those two features, those values existed long before they were codified. The fact is they were existed in the stories and the artifacts that already existed in the organization. This was just putting words to them. That's example number one. Example number two, let's talk about a company, uh, 3M. Develop, you know, very, very strong R&D, creator of a lot of, of really powerful inventions and innovations, uh, perhaps best known for the post-it note. Uh, and next to the post-it note is a gentleman named Arthur Fry, the inventor of the post-it note. And, you know, the story goes that during Slack time, so, so prior to Google giving people time, Slack time, bootlegging time to work on their own projects, 3M was among the first to do that. They gave people in their organization time to work on projects on their own thing. And they also had technical councils. Again, these are the little things, the artifacts, where people shared whatever they were working on with each other. The scientists working there shared things. And so Arthur Fry was a scientist. He sang in a church choir. And every week, he'd have the hymn book. And he would tear pieces of paper and use those as bookmarks. And by the end of, of choir performance, they would have all fallen out on the floor. At one of these technical councils, he came across a gentleman who was trying to create a very, very strong adhesive and it wasn't going very well. And so because there was time to continue working on his own project, the artifact of Slack time, and there was these technical councils where people would share whatever they were working on, both successes and failures, Arthur Fry saw this adhesive that wasn't doing its job being very strong, but saw that as an opportunity to perhaps create something that was not that sticky, that wouldn't tear books, and that you could, but would still hold their place. And so over a couple of years, the two of them worked together to develop the post-it note. So there's a story there, but the artifacts are the Slack time, the technical council, and even the post-it note itself. What is the assumption? What drives this? Put fences around people and all you get are sheep. The idea is to give people freedom, to allow them to experiment, to give them opportunities to interact with each other, but not force them to, and you're likely to get more and better innovation that way. And so that, because it's an R&D center, that was something that influenced a lot of what 3M did and what they continue to do. And so that existed for a long time until more recently when 3M codified their values and they put up, you know, these are among two of, I think, five or six values, you know, value and develop our employees' diverse talents, initiative and leadership, and importantly, earn the admiration of those associated with 3M worldwide. Right? It's not necessarily about being flashy, it's about being creative and inventive and, and taking other people's failures and putting them to use. And so these are, are sort of stylized examples, but the idea is linking what's going on in the organization, the artifacts, lived experience to the drivers of behavior. And so that's really where things, that's, the action really happens around the assumptions because that's what's motivating people's behaviors. And so it's worth asking yourself, you know, what are the artifacts of your team and your company? What are the little things that people experience on a daily basis? Keeping in mind that in the current crisis, when everybody's working from home, you don't get to experience things. The tangible aspects are no longer there. So a lot of it's behavioral, a lot of it's around the structure of, of interactions and interpersonal engagement via email, via technology, whatever it might be. And so the artifacts have changed. And so what messages are they sending? And this is very much linked to the little things. What are the small things that are sending messages about how you expect people to behave, whether they're new or they've been there for 15 years? And importantly, you'll note that in both the examples I gave, there are stories, right? Stories about Jeff Bezos being crafty and, and, and efficient in his early days. Stories about Arthur Fry taking somebody else's failure and turning it into success, right? So there's stories that are linked to artifacts. You know, what are the stories that are being told about people on your team during the crisis? 
Who are the heroes? That's going to tell you a lot about the culture that and the expectations around culture uh, coming out of this. You know, and so what are the stories that are told about the artifacts and what do they suggest about your assumptions? I would encourage you to actually start to map these things and unpack them and figure out, okay, this is actually how we can start to diagram the culture in our particular organization. But beware, because assumptions actually evolve over time. Uh, and as another extreme example, I point you to the case of Uber. Um, we may have some Uber employees or ex-employees on here. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, ill will, uh, but you did, but you do uh, present it, the company it presents a really interesting case. Uh, right, going back to 2012, there was a lot of talk about regulation, but it was about creative destruction. And the general theme, uh, you know, and the assumption that drove a lot of behavior within Uber was it's okay for us as a company to break some rules because we're changing the world. Right? I think there was very much that chip on the shoulder and there was an aggressiveness to it based on, on Travis's general demeanor and behavior. But the idea was like, it's okay to break rules because we have to, you know, got to break a few eggs to make, to make an omelet sort of thing. Now, if you fast forward to 2017 and beyond, right, how that, that assumption got twisted and interpreted in different ways. Uh, and now it went from it's okay for us as a company to break rules very much to it's okay for me as an individual working there to break rules because I'm exceptional, right? From the company is exceptional and can push ahead to I as an individual and exceptional and therefore the rules don't apply to me. And you can see how that assumption can gradually morph based on a couple little things uh, which brings us to takeaway number three um, around those couple little things. Takeaway number three is about a quick culture gauge and specifically four questions that you can ask to get a better sense of culture. This is something you can use to, as an assessment within your own team. Uh, you can also use it if you're looking for a new job, especially in this environment where you can't meet people face to face, but you want to get a sense of what a culture is like in a particular organization. Um, I might suggest starting by asking, who or what gets punished in your organization? And how does that punishment take place, right? You know, you can find out, is it a yelling culture? Is it a culture of shame? Is it a culture of nobody actually addresses issues? Uh, but you're gonna learn a lot about what's allowed and what's not allowed by asking who or what behaviors get punished in your organization and how do they get punished? Uh, and there's a, a, a nice quote from Ben Horowitz um, uh, who says, it's impossible to design a bug-free culture but it's vital to understand that the most dangerous bugs are the ones that cause ethical breaches. Uh, and there's really interesting recent research that suggests that companies whose mission statements talk about locomotion, like um, move fast, uh, just to use one example, or um, always be hustling, that was one of Uber's early, early kind of mission statements, uh, they're actually more likely to behave in unethical ways. Uh, and so that's really concerning, right? You wanna be wary of the cultures where it's always about pushing ahead without consideration for the sort of the damage left in the wake. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that comes down to individual behaviors and what people are allowed to get away with or not. And so the bottom line here, culture is not what you say. Culture is not what's written on the walls. Culture is what you do and really culture is what you don't do and don't allow. So question one, what gets punished? How does it get punished? And, and where are the boundaries? And are those boundaries that you think you're comfortable with? Question two, sort of the flip of that, who or what, what kinds of behaviors or what kinds of individuals get rewarded in your organization and why? And when I say rewarded, I don't necessarily mean who gets the big bonuses, uh, although that is interesting and we'll tell you about the, about the company culture, but you know, what are the things that, that people get a lot of support for, a good reputation, you know, any kind of informal reward, who are those people and why is it that they're getting rewarded? That's gonna tell you about what a company values. Third, related to that, who has status and how do they get it? Who are the people that everybody looks up to that are highly regarded in the organization? And, and what is it about them that, that grants them that status? What have they done? Is it because they work 120 hours a week? Might be. If you're assessing another company culture and you're debating whether or not you wanna go work there, you may wanna consider whether that's the way that you wanna live your life in order to be successful in that organization. Uh, and so it's worth asking, what are the things that get people rewarded in their organization? And then finally, you know, if you're, especially, this is a good one for interviews. It, it, this comes from Adam Grant, uh, for those of you that are familiar with Adam. <clears throat> Tell me about something that happens in your company that doesn't happen anywhere else. Basically, what makes your, your culture and your organization pretty unique? And then 
you know, why is that indicative of your firm's culture? I think it's important to ask the questions that are, are not just sort of stock and that are going to get people to be thoughtful about what things are like in the organization. That's if you're assessing a new opportunity. But if you're in, in the situation of trying to figure out what's going on with your own culture, these are great questions to ask your team. Ask yourself, sit down, run through these with your team and see if people are aligned with each other. See if the culture sends us a consistent message to everybody that's working there or not. Uh, <clears throat> so those are four questions as a quick culture gauge uh, that you can use whether assessing a new situation or if you are looking to, to make a move uh, or if you're looking to assess your own team. Which brings me to my final takeaway. Uh, and that is a little empathy goes a long way. And in particular in the current climate, you know, given what I said up front about the global environment, the, sta the state of, of the world within product management as well. But, you know, I would say that this is something that, that kind of stands for all time, not necessarily just right now. And I want to give an example. Um, this was making the rounds on, on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so this was posted in May, so, you know, about a month ago. Uh, and this guy, Mark Richardson, uh, works for the Canadian government, and he posted um, an email with work at home guidelines for people from the Canadian government. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to read them to you because I think they're pretty amazing. Um, number one, you're not working from home. You're at your home during a crisis trying to work. Number two, your personal, physical, mental, and emotional health is far more important than anything else right now. Number three, you should not try to compensate for lost productivity by working longer hours. Number four, you'll be kind to yourself and not judge how you are coping based on how you see others coping. Number five, you'll be kind to others and not judge how they are coping based on how you are coping. Number six, your team's success will not be measured the same way <clears throat> as it was when things were normal. Now, you may roll your eyes. You may say that sounds nice in theory. Uh, that gives a lot of lip service. This is, hey, no, isn't that just the same as the values that you were talking about before? Maybe, maybe. But can you imagine being on the receiving end of an email like this talking about your work at home situation. I think your goodwill towards the organization, especially if even some modicum of this was actually put into practice, not all of it, but 10%, 20%, right? Think about how much stronger you would feel about your organization, how much more relieved you would feel about your own situation to get something like this. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have to have this kind of manifesto, but something that basically says to the people on your team and in your organization, if you're in a position to, to make these sorts of decrees, look, we get it and understand that this is a challenging time and we want you to, to be comfortable. We want you to take care of yourself. You know, yes, you still have a job uh, if you're amongst the fortunate who do, but, and we expect you to, to act accordingly, but we very much understand the current situation and we want you to, to know we empathize. Um, and in product, empathy, you, you, yes, you focus on it for user problems and for the user journey, but it's essential. You need to have it to be an effective product manager or product leader. You, you have to understand what your users are going through in, in terms of like their needs, in terms of their entire process from onboarding to the use of whatever product or service you're working on. And so I, I've said this before in other presentations for PMF, you know, the toolkit that you have as a product manager is actually wonderful for managing people. Uh, the question is how much do you actually take that toolkit and apply it internally? Uh, and so, you know, the, my main question here is how much are you applying your insights, your consumer and user insight skill set on your own team, especially right now? Um, like I said, you don't have to put out an empathy manifesto, uh, but something that recognizes the difficulties uh, include, faced by everyone, including your team, it's going to pay dividends in the long run, right? There's massive benefits for having that empathy for site safety, for team cohesion, for feelings of attachment and loyalty, and there's just not a lot of downside from demonstrating that bit of humanity. And, and I think sort of along a related line, I would say, you know, in terms of having empathy for people, assume positive intent with your team. Uh, technology has a funny way of, of mixing up messages and signals and tones and things like that. Um, and, and we bring a lot of history with our coworkers with us into our now remote working. And so we can probably layer on our expectations of how they're going to act towards us and the tone that they might take with us. And, and related to having empathy, I think, you know, assuming positive intent amongst your team and your coworkers uh, in the current climate is going to, you know, it's going to get you, it's going to get you out of more trouble than it's going to get you into, I think. Um, because things, signals just simply do get crossed when thinking about and working through technology. Uh, so in closing, 
Uh, your role in driving work culture, generally speaking, uh, coming back to IBM, this is a quote from Lou Gerstner, who was head of the architect of IBM's turnaround in the 90s. Uh, and he said, changing the attitude and behavior of groups of people is very, very hard to accomplish. Business schools don't teach you how to do it. I object to that particular remark. However, the point is, is well taken. Uh, what you can do as management, as leadership, is to create the conditions for transformation. You provide the incentives. You define the marketplace realities and goals. But then you have to trust. In fact, in the end, management doesn't change culture. Management invites the workforce to change itself to change culture. So regardless of where you sit in an organization, you have a responsibility for managing and driving culture. If you're management, you have to create the conditions and then let go. And if you are not management, it's up to you to, to, un, to grasp culture, to try to take it and, and twist it into the way that you want it to be, to be manifested in an organization and then run with it. Uh, so the responsibility runs to everyone in the organization. More specifically, for those of you in, in product, you know, things are naturally going to shift going forward. Yes, they're shift, shifted right now, but even looking into the future, there's going to be a lot more remote work. There's going to be a lot of physical, social and physical distancing going on. Things are going to change when it comes to culture and how it operates. You, in product, very much have a role in how culture will look in your organizations going forward. Uh, and you know, people in product, you play a connector or broker role. For those of you that have, have taken any of my network sessions, you know what a broker is. You connect a lot of different areas of the organizations. And so it's up to you to determine and model the behavior that you would like to be part of the culture going forward, right? You have access to lots of different people. You can take the temperature of different cultural aspects and, and different types of behaviors, see what's gonna play well, see what's not gonna, not gonna play well. You can diffuse across lots of different areas of the organization. So working in that kind of broker role gives you a huge benefit when it comes to being able to, to influence culture going forward. Number two, I said this earlier, but use your product management skills, right? You have expertise better than most in most organizations as far as being team oriented, as far as being user centric, as far as being empathy promoting. You know, use those techniques to create the conditions for everybody in your company and pay close attention to the little things the small little behaviors and rituals and attitudes and processes that add up and really start to create and send messages around culture. And then finally, the specificities of culture matter less than consistency. You know, I personally have a stance on, on top-down command and control hierarchical culture versus a flatter, more employee-driven, diffuse responsibility culture. You can probably guess where I stand based on the way that I colored those two things. But companies can be effective with both. And the issue is, is not around what you choose. The issue is, do all the aspects of your organization, organization's culture actually help reinforce whichever choice you've made? It's when individuals start getting conflicting messages and conflicting aspects of culture that you really run into difficulty. And whichever you choose becomes much, much harder to execute on. Uh, and so be thoughtful about not just what you want from a big picture of culture, but how all the little things are either contributing to it or taking away from it. Um, if this sort of topic, uh, as far as leadership, as far as culture, as far as product leadership specifically, is of interest to you, um, your luck, you've come to the right place. Uh, along with Product Management Festival, I am the director and, and teacher in the product, ma product Management Executive Program. You can see the dates on the bottom there. At this very moment, our hope is that these will be face-to-face. -face. Uh, we'll have to see if the world will cooperate with us. Um, but uh, I encourage you to join us. For those of you that have questions, we've got about 10 minutes left. I actually, I actually did it. Um, and uh, you know, I'm happy to stick around a few minutes after the fact to, to uh, answer questions for those of you if, if you would like to, to do just that. So with that, Grace, I will, I will let you uh, sort of, MC, I will hand the MC back over to you and you can uh, collect and, and let me know some of the questions that we've gotten, if we've gotten any. Yes, thanks so much, Noah. This was really insightful. Um, we do have a question. Um, we have someone who is in between positions, and she was mentioning that the four, the, uh, relating to the four questions to evaluate your culture. So those four questions mm -hmm. are, are good, and, the, and honest answers will be helpful to evaluate mm -hmm. the culture in a time where she may have to accept an offer before ever being on site. How honest do you think interviewers will be on those questions? She's a little bit concerned if they're going to couch their answers as they're trying to sell the company to her. 
Yeah, I, that's a very real consideration. It's a good question um, because right there, they're in sales mode. Uh, and, and what I would suggest is to triangulate. And by that, I mean, don't just ask your interviewer. Don't just ask one person. Talk to a number of people in the organization. And look, there may be a party line and people are very big on just saying the same thing and they, and they know what to say and they've rehearsed it. Um, I don't think that people get these sorts of questions all that often. Uh, and so I think you might take them aback a little bit, which is actually a good thing because they haven't had time to rehearse it. Um, but I think asking a lot of different people and then use your network, use your own network, talk to people that, that either have worked there or can make an introduction to somebody who, who works there or has worked there. Um, and so you really need to, to make sure that you triangulate the answers and even something as simple as glass door. Now look, glass door, you have to take it with the appropriate grain of salt, but you have to take the answers from the people you're talking to with a grain of salt too. And so the trick is to really try to figure out how can I talk to enough people to start to get a clearer sense of, am I getting an accurate response to what gets punished, who gets rewarded, et cetera. Thank you. Jane asks, uh, I have a question about your question three. Um, I think that slide was very popular. Uh, how would you mm -hmm. define people with status in a company versus just a leadership or executive position? Uh, great question. You've come to the right place. I did my dissertation on status, uh, um, which is not something I say in public all that often. Um, but uh, so status, status is a lot about who do the highly respected people respect themselves. And so, yes, a lot of times status is correlated with position in an organization. But my suspicion is most of you that are on this call right now can probably think of plenty of leaders or plenty of senior people in organizations that you work for that didn't have a lot of status, right? They were not particularly well respected or highly regarded by anyone, let alone other highly regarded people. And so, you know, start to look not necessarily, yes, you can look at the senior people and, and start to get a sense from that. But look at the people who aren't senior, who people still talk about a lot, who, who the senior people themselves really like, who um, are really well connected in the organization. Right? I think about status from, from the respect angle, but also from a network angle. And so who are the really well connected people in the organization? Who does everybody go to? Um, and, and oftentimes it's not the most senior people. There are people at different levels in, in the organization that people come to to talk about work, that come to find out who do I need to talk to if I have this kind of question? Um, if I need to figure this out, who are the people that I should go to? That's gonna give you a better sense of, of who are the high status people. And I would actually encourage you to avoid the, the senior leadership in the formal hierarchy and to really think about, okay, who, who are the people that still would be considered as high status if I take those people off the table? Because now you're gonna really get a much better sense of what gets rewarded and how and who's looked upon really fondly. Um, and it's easy to just be like, okay, well, it's just the people that work the hardest to do the best. Yeah, that's probably true. But what is it, what, what does doing the best work mean in that particular context? Why do the senior people like them so much? Is it effort? Is it, is it wit? Is it team management? You know, there's, is it the fact that they, they've launched a hugely su successful product? Like, what is it that they've done that has led them to have that status? And so I think there are ways to come at it that don't just align with the formal hierarchy. But good question. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Jane, um, uh, I, have another, I have another question. And this person is saying that I used physical space as a critical tool in connecting my team with each other and with the rest of the organization. I've lost that in my toolkit, obviously, um, and, and a lot less organic connections are being made now. Um, so I see a lot more tribalism or AKA strong silos. Any ideas or thoughts on how to recreate the organic part of culture that isn't overly manufactured? Tough one. Uh, and it's something that I've actually been asked about a lot lately um, because people are really curious about that. Like, how do I recreate the human aspect of, it, of this, the chance encounter aspect of this, um, and, and to avoid silos and tribes and things like that? And honestly, I don't have a great answer for you um, because I do think the technological tools that we have just aren't quite there. And if you're if you want to do something like, hey, let's host, ho uh, hold a Zoom happy hour, you know, that you can hear people's eyes rolling back in their heads, even as you mentioned it. And even if it's fun, even if it's better than you expect, right? The initial reaction to something like that is always going to be pretty pretty strong and not usually super positive. And so a lot of it has to do with um, creating superordinate goals. 
which means how is it that you can take those tribes and create a sense of, of something bigger than the two tribes that they have to commit to, right? And, and that's a lot easier said than done, but super ordering goals is about taking a disparate group of people and figuring out what is it that brings them together? What are the goals? What are the challenges? What are the, what are the opportunities that can actually bring them together and, and make them much more likely to, to actually view each other as necessary and important and not the enemy? Um, and so that's one way to do it. The other way, which I would recommend slightly less highly, is to create a third them. Uh, I'm not never a fan of othering, but if you create a sense of teamwork amongst those tribes, uh, you know, against some other, hopefully a competitor, not somebody else in the organization necessarily, you're, you're likely to build in that sort of, okay, we identify because we actually are on the same team versus, you know, this competitor who's doing X or Y that we're in deep trouble if we sort of go down that path, you know, if we, if we don't combat them, that can bring people together. Um, but, you know, if you have good ways of bringing people together, there's a lot of political posts out there right now that could probably use your help. Um, so, you know, I, I give, give those suggestions with, with the knowledge that it's really, really challenging. Um, and, and our current, as we know it, basically bringing tribes together effectively, especially when they can't physically interact, is a pretty tough thing to do. Maybe take one or two more, Grace? Uh, yeah, I think um, I have one. Um, what is an ideal organizational culture? I feel like this could be a, a somewhat of a big one, but um, do you have uh, any ideas on that? So there is no such thing as an ideal uh, organizational culture. I think you know different people have different needs and expectations and, and desires. So ideal is sort of in the eye of the beholder. Uh, what is it that you want and want to be part of? I think that's one. Two, I think a lot of it has to do with what is it you're trying to accomplish, right? If you're all about innovation, if you have a very top-down command and control, rigid hierarchical organization, it's pretty tough to generate innovation. Um, you need to have ideas coming from lots of different places and, and people with different backgrounds. You need to cultivate diversity and diverse points of view and diverse areas of expertise to bring those together and to recombine them for, for innovation. And so to the extent that you, you kind of squash diversity and squash voices other than the most senior people or person, you're not going to have a whole lot of innovation. On the other hand, if you're all about execution at, on, you know, on a moment's notice, if you sort of have this diffuse, very diverse group of people who all have different ideas about how to do things, it's pretty difficult to bring them together and get them going in the right direction really quickly if you need to execute really fast. And so, you know, in the, in the academic literature, we talk about uh, exploiters and explorers, um, which I think Rashira is or was on here. And, uh, you know, that goes back 15 years for her. But uh, explorers is, are the innovators. They're the people that are looking for new and different competitive advantage. And exploiters are all about sort of execution and refining their existing competitive advantage. They're going to have very different cultures because they need them as a means of, of survival. Uh, and so there is not a, a, an ideal culture. It really is what is it that the company is trying to accomplish uh, and, and who do they want to attract. And then from, the, from your perspective, it's where do I feel the most comfortable and what aligns with my values most effectively in the way that I want to live and, and work. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we do have another question. Perhaps if you have time, we'll do one more. Sure. Okay. Sure, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Can you suggest any artifacts or rituals to start putting in place for geographically distant product teams, uh, which we can start putting in place now? It's a good question. I think I think the the sort of the positive psychology one of just starting meetings with with uh, piece of, latest piece of good news. Um, I think is a good one. I think if you're looking for more, you know, team cohesion or building around product specific things, you know, even, even thinking of the type of questions you would ask in an interview, you know, what's a product you sell lately that you love and why? Starting to see how people think, see what they respond to, see what their design sensibilities might be like. Um, you know, talk about uh, personal examples where we're asking people to not necessarily be overly vulnerable, but to share a little bit about themselves, their points of view, their backgrounds. Those sorts of things go a long way towards building team cohesion and, and psychological safety. When people feel comfortable sharing opinions without concern for the reaction or response it's gonna get, that's ultimately what you want. Those are the, the highest functioning teams. And so you as a, as a manager, team leader, whatever, 
need to be modeling and role modeling that behavior. Um, but I think asking for people's, you know, personal opinions, personal experiences, and then showing that you're willing and open to do it, and then make sure that when other people share theirs, that everybody's accepting, even if they don't agree with it, even if they don't like it, that's how you start to build psychological safety. Now, that doesn't mean you don't necessarily have times when you need to say, look, that's not the idea we're looking for, we need to move forward. But as far as building team cohesion, a big, big part of that is an open, a willingness to be open and to share points of view, ideas, uh, things that may be even more emotional, and that's really going to help to help set that. So anything, any kind of question that allows that to take place is going to is going to go a long way towards helping build that team cohesion. Great. Thanks, Noah. Sure. So I think um, we are coming to the end here. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to mention a couple things that we have going on that I thought perhaps could be of interest to you everyone. Uh, as Noah mentioned, we do have our Trends and Benchmarks report. It is available for free download, so you're welcome to take a look at um, that for you and, and your team. And the other one is that in conjunction with this, uh, we have an initiative for a webinar series that highlights the different parts of the report. And the first one that's coming up is dedicated to a leadership topic, um, and it will be hosted by Adrian Zwingli, our co-founder of TMF, as well as David Marquette, who is a retired military leader, author, um, he was also one of the keynote speakers from um, last year's PMF conference and is an excellent uh, speaker too. So this will be a, a webinar that is also available um, for free as well. So with that, I wanted to just thank everybody for joining us today. If you have any questions, um, feel free, you can find us at pmep.education. Um, and Noah, thank you so much for your presentation. Very insightful. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you to everybody for coming. Uh